Seek the truth and free your mind at dogmadebate.com. It'll upset you. It'll make you laugh. But most importantly, it'll make you think. This is Dogma Debate with David Smalley. Today is Friday, March 27th. This is the Dogma Debate. I'm your host, David Smalley, and we are broadcasting live from San Jose, California. Wow. Wow. I think that's the best one we've ever had. I'm not kidding. That's all I came here for. Peace, I'm out of here. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out. Today's going to be a super exciting show. Uh, we are broadcasting for the atheist community of San Jose. Uh, you folks affiliated with that group? You heard of them a little bit? Yeah. We're going to talk uh, to Brian from that group in just a moment, as well as Julie. I'll introduce th those folks in just a second. We do have, uh, how many people here are familiar with the Crazy Song of the Week segment? Yeah, yeah? okay. You guys remember, it started off, for, for, the, for the, that dedicated fourth listener, it started off as the Country Song of the Week. Well, <laughs> today we're going back to our roots. Uh, and it's your fault, a listener sent it to me. Uh, so we'll be getting into that next segment. We do have a country crazy song of the week. Greta Christina will be joining me shortly, as well as Richard Carrier, both of them. <laughs> they will be joining us live on stage in just a few minutes, and uh, Pastor Bob Crosslin is going to be joining us for the majority of the show. So Brian Broom is the, well, what is your title with the? I am the president and founder. The president and founder <laughs> of, of the, the atheist, atheist community. community of San Jose, and I said that correctly. Yes, thank you. I get brownie points for that. Yes. I have to. Very cool. So how long has the organization been in existence? We are almost at our two-year anniversary, April 1st. Almost two years. <laughs> Very cool. Definitely. And Julie Wedge is with us. Hello, Julie. Hello. How are you? Scoot up for me. That's so, and you are with uh, an organization, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, the organization not necessarily, but you're here to talk about Humanist House. That's correct. I cannot wait to get more into that and find out more about it. She was telling me about it over the phone a little bit, and I'm super, super excited. So I want to start uh, with you, Brian. Tell me a little bit about why the atheist community of San Jose uh, was really founded, put together, and what are your missions and goals? So we are here to support the atheist community, and we just saw a need uh, locally, and we wanted to give people an opportunity to find like-minded individuals for friendship and philanthropy and all that great stuff that uh, is part of the community. So you guys aren't necessarily out protesting and doing that type of thing. You're building a community. We're absolutely not an activist group. So we are dedicated to making sure everybody... Um, uh, find something interesting in their lives and make their lives better. We want to uh, you know, have presentations and go out and do good things in, the, in, in our community locally and just be a part of everything like everybody else is and be atheist and proud of it. That's very cool, very cool. I, I've had groups uh, email me before and say things like, you know, 
I, I, I joined up my local atheist group. And I hate it because all they do is sit around and bitch and moan and complain. And we don't ever do anything. They're not involved. They're not protesting. And I'm like, guys, that, believe it or not, that's part of building a community. Being around like-minded people where you can even say those things without getting kicked out of your house or your college fund taken away or your driver's license restricted or not allowed around family, that type of stuff is important. So I don't, I, I don't like it when they look at it in a negative way. I say, look, if you want that, find an activist group in your area if you want to do activism. But if this group is about community, let them be about community and enjoy that aspect of it. So I think it's very important what you're doing right now. Great. Very cool. And so, no, go ahead. If you want to cheer for that, feel free. Feel free. Now, Julie, tell us about the organization that you're with and the concept behind the Humanist House. I'm the executive director for the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley. Uh, it is a project that has been sort of incubating and being talked about in the community for roughly, oh, 30 years. And we are uh, actually going to make it real. Uh, we are talking about doing, getting a space and Brian has been really great. We've been talking to other free thought community uh, people in the Bay Area. And we're looking at getting a space that the free thought community can use for things like pop-up clinics. Does everybody know what a pop-up clinic is? No? Pop-up clinics, something like get a bunch of attorneys that are willing to do some pro bono work on a Saturday and have people come in and ask their legal questions. That would be a pop-up legal clinic. You have some educators that come in and want to do some tutoring on a particular weekday. That would be a pop-up education clinic. So uh, it involves directly what we do in our community. And the key to this is, of course, making sure that it's measurable and that, it's, that our deliverables can be... Um, you know, sort of put into metrics. I think that what we all realize as free thinkers is that uh, our community isn't necessarily, when we ask what we do, we all do really good stuff. And we all do really good stuff for a lot of really great organizations. But we can't really measure what we do collectively. And so Humanist House is a place where we can all get together, we can incubate ideas, we can talk to elected, local elected officials, find out what the needs of the community are from local elected officials, we can talk to local community leaders, we can decide what is necessary. Food security, big deal right now in San Jose, right? We all know that, uh, that uh, the jungle got closed, right? Kind of bulldozed over. We have a whole bunch of you know, families, 300 to 400 homeless people. Uh, I'm a graduate of San Jose State University. I remember the jungle being around when I graduated, well, I graduated in 92. So having that to be gone and not really have, you know, a place for these people to have any kind of stability, any kind of security, any kind of food security, any kind of any of those things. So what we're doing is we're bringing this to the community, and we're hoping that everybody gets involved, we're hoping that everybody buys in, and we're hoping that everybody brings their ideas, because none of this is going to happen unless we can incubate our ideas together. And we can talk a lot, but until we actually do, we don't actually offer anything to our arms that are fighting in legislatures and are fighting, you know, I mean, we're with Compassion and Choices, right? Everybody knows about Compassion and Choices in California right now? Yes? No? No? Oh, please explain. It's very, very important. It is very important. There's a bill going through the legislature right now. It did just pass out of Senate Health and Human Services. It's Compassion and Choices. Death with Dignity is another name for it. Something that... How many know it by Death with dig death Dignity? Death with Dignity. Okay, All there right. we go. There, there we go. go. So we're involved in this, and we're obviously involved with some faith-based groups that are going to be doing some pushback, right? Anytime that you do any kind of lobbying, anytime that you have your arms of people that go into local city halls all the way up to your legislature and even on a federal level, the thing that they ask you is, well, what kind of benefit do you have in your community? What do you do? And while it's nice to be able to say that I volunteer for Planned Parenthood and maybe somebody else volunteers for the ACLU or maybe somebody else does something else, if we were actually to lay on the table, well, we did 10 pop-up clinics this year that serviced 3,422 of your constituents. Guess who's going to listen to that? Your elected officials, your community leaders, yeah. right? And we can see right now what's going on in Indiana is appalling. There's a gigantic community of people that are going to need to be served that are clearly not being served by the faith-based community. Why can't we do that? There's money out there. There's grants that we can write. There's people like you in the room that 
care about your individual communities. And the cool part about this is we get to launch this here in Silicon Valley, where we have a lot of free thinkers, where we have a lot of people that want to invest time and money and excitement and energy into a project like this in the free thought community. And if we incubate this here, we get to test it out, right? Scientific method, trial and error. What do we do, right? It's exciting. And we get to incubate all these thoughts and ideas. And at the end of it, we should have something that we can give to the free thought community. There's 170 American Humanist Association chapters across the country. If you could give them Humanist House, how huge would that be for our community as a whole? What then do we bring to the table in large, large numbers that are measurable for us? So I'm excited about the opportunities. I'm excited about working with Brian. I'm excited about working with the entire free thought community. And uh, I hope everybody gets on board. Very cool. I love it. I love it. It's interesting that you referred to him as Brian because I could have swore Vince Vaughn was sitting up here with me. I almost asked him for his autograph when I walked in. 50 bucks. <laughs> Giving yeah. poor Vince a bad rap. Now, now, <laughs> now I know uh, we're, we're, all, we're already out of time for this segment, but I, this is so important. Uh, and my listeners know I don't care about time. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try my best for tonight. Um, when you and I were talking about this, and you mentioned um, uh, this idea of helping some homeless folks get back to work, talk briefly about that. We have to wrap it up quickly, because I want to share something with you about that and see how we can collaborate off air. But, but say again what, what you said to me about, about putting, putting them to work. The ultimate goal is to find things in which you don't have to have individual donors. Right? The ultimate goal is to create a sustainable program that you can grant right for, that there is funding for. So there are things like if we were to buy a restaurant and do an organic restaurant, you can then staff that restaurant with uh, reentry homeless veterans. You can staff food trucks that go out into the homeless community with LGBT homeless youth. You can, there's, there are sustainability grants around these types of activities that the faith-based community is, quite frankly, not going to touch. And the faith-based community does a fine job with their volunteerism. They certainly keep a ton of metrics. But in those types of communities where things are not what they should be, and the volunteerism isn't outreaching, and especially in the faith-based community, because they shun people that are queer or people of color or women or, you know, I don't know what they're afraid of, afraid of vaginas. I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, there is a large swath of people that are underserved. And our community is compassionate enough, our community is intelligent enough, and our community uh, wants to do things in the name of nobody just because it's the right thing to do. So that's what we're sure. looking at, and, and that's what and so, you had. Yeah, so several years ago, and, and I guess I'll just throw it out there now. I've never really talked about it publicly, but I, I had this concept because I used to work at hotels when I was younger. I was a teenager, and I got so much work experience from being in a hotel. I did, I was, a, I was a bellman for a while. I worked behind the front desk, so I handled money and customer service. I worked in the restaurant for a while, so I learned serving and, and, and food prep. Uh, they would move me over to maintenance and I would help fix an air conditioner and then I was in housekeeping and I was folding towels. I mean, you can, you, if you work in a hotel, you can get pretty much, I mean, a lot of trades that you can take out and then go, go do that job full time. Right. And so I thought, you know, a hotel, I think is a, a perfect place for someone who is trying to get their life back on track, mm -hmm. they have a place to stay mm -hmm. at an affordable rate, if we can make it an affordable rate, and then that person can work there and live there. A portion of their salary could help go into a savings fund for them when they get out, and then they could learn a trade. And so I, I came up with this concept of uh, a secular life rehabilitation program. Right. And at first it was gonna be like a center where you work. And I'm like, you know, as a program, implementing this in multiple hotels to say, look, why don't you have 10% of your workers that are, say, homeless vets or something like that? You help them have a trade, help them work, put them back into the workforce. They have a savings when they get out, and they've got a place to stay while they're working. This gives them the best possible, I think, avenue for success because you're not just giving them a place to stay for a night like many of the churches do that also charge them 3 or $5 for a place to sleep when it's raining. It's a place to say, 
uh, it's a way to actually put them back into the workforce. So it's a, it's right. a full life rehabilitation. And it wouldn't be relegated only to people who are absolutely have no place to stay and that is the only requirement. It could be anybody who needs a, who needs a reset. I think we've all been at a point in our lives that we'd like to hit the reset button mm-hmm. to go, can I just kind of start over and, and, and shake the sillies out and kind of get, get on with my life. And if you're at a point like that, I think you should be able to do that. Absolutely. And so that was a concept I had. And when I, when I heard you say that, or actually when I saw the text, I, it rang back off. Like, I have not had this concept of the Secular Life Rehabilitation Program in like three years because I've been so busy with this. And so that's something that I think Humanist House could, could implement. Absolutely. And it's, those, and it's actually those exact kind of ideas and thoughts that we're going to be incubated over the next few months. We're hoping to find a, a space by the 1st of July. I know that that's extremely ambitious. But if we don't set ambitious goals, we're just going to continue to talk about things without doing anything. So uh, we've set an ambitious goal of being in a place by the 1st of July. We would really like for um, everybody in the free thought community to see that as home, as a place where they can, you know, and and as we start talking about what we're going to do, buying a hotel, how awesome. Right? I mean, yeah. that would be really great. Or, it, or even signing up the Marriott and Hilton and all these other, other places to commit to 10% of their workforce. Something. Something right. along those something lines. Something along those lines. But all of these ideas have to come to the table. And we can't just incubate them within the humanist community of Silicon Valley. We have to incubate them in the free thought community as a whole. We have to have everybody at the table. Everybody has to have, a, it has to have input. And all ideas are welcome. Now, that doesn't mean that all the ideas are going to work. And it doesn't mean that all ideas are going sure. to raise money. But it does mean that if all ideas are at the table and we're looking at everything when we're doing this, then we're going to have a much better list of things that I could then take to the mayor of San Jose. And So, so tell, tell us how we can sign up, how people can get involved. Humanists.org, H-U-M-A-N-I-S-T-S.org. There's a little summary of what Humanist House is. There's the availability to email us, tell us what you want to be a part of. How humanists, to, plural. Yes, humanists. more than one Org. humanist. There are several humanists. <laughs> dot org. Very cool. And you can donate. You can uh, say that you want to volunteer. You can tell me that you want to, you know, send ideas. Please, whatever, whatever. We need you. Very cool. And and if you uh, get Vince, involved, I mean Brian. Uh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, if you want to get involved in the ACSJ, um, San Jose Atheist dot org. And I just want to real quick say thank you to everybody for coming out today. Thank because, you all very much. Yeah. Without your, with, without you guys participating, we couldn't bring David here. So this is really huge. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you both so much. Thank you both for what you're doing for the community. I really, really appreciate it. Give them another hand, please. <laughs> now, now, who here absolutely loves the crazy song of the week segment? Like, okay. Okay, now, now, like, who loves it most out of that group? Like, like, okay, now, who just went, yeah, like, stand up. Come up here. Wait a minute, stop right there. Come on over, come on up, come on. Have a seat right here. <laughs> That's only funny to the people here. <laughs> his, his shirt says, I'm a hardcore Christian. So I stopped him, and he turned around, and it says, Bale fan. You got to love Christian Bale. Come on. Got it. Got it. <laughs> now, now who, who else here loves the country or crazy song of the week segment as much as this guy? Uh, I, I, I see two screaming. Who wants to join him for the next segment? Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Oh, they're, they're both going to come. No, come on. Come on. So go ahead. No, 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 no. I, no, I'm going to talk to both of you during the commercial break. Come here. I will be with fourth listeners right here when we come back. More dogma debate after this. Make some noise. This is Andrea from Sydney, Australia. I'm the fourth listener. 
To get your comment or question on the air, you can always live tweet during the show at David C. Smalley or give us a call at 214-377-1166. The conversation continues on Facebook.com slash Dogma Debate. Seek the truth and free your mind at DogmaDebate.com. We are given one life full of billions of small and large decisions to be somebody, to change, to be kind, to give hope, to become a better person, and to leave a lasting impact on this planet. It is a decision to be made every single day while your heart is still beating. We've made our decision. Absence of clothing. Atheist and science-based apparel and merchandise. Donating 50% of our profits to charity. Look good and feel good without God. Check us out at absenceofclothing.com and find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr. Use discount code DOGMADEBATE for 10% off your purchase. Yo, 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 check out this chef, right? <laughs> right? That's so gay. That's really gay. Dude, look at those pants. Please don't say that. What? Don't say that something is gay when you mean that something is dumb or stupid. It's insulting. Mm-hmm. It's like if I thought this pepper shaker was stupid, and I said, man, and this pepper shaker is so 16-year-old boy with a cheesy mustache. Just saying. A show so liberal, you'll think MSNBC is the religious right. You're listening to Dogma Debate with David Smalley. Welcome back to Dogma Debate. We're still broadcasting live from San Jose. Yeah, we are. Yeah, baby. Yes, yes, yes. We have some dedicated fourth listeners up here with us. Uh, Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, My name is Nico, and I'm not a hardcore Christian. I'm sorry. (laughs) You are a hardcore Christian bail Bail fan. fan, Got you. Cat. My name's Kat, and I am the fourth listener. Awesome. <laughs> My name is Lawrence, and I am, will be a fourth listener. <laughs> but I won the free T-shirts. So. <laughs> but you won the free T-shirts. So I, I guess I owe you guys. We'll, we'll let obligation. you stay up here. We'll let you stay up here anyway. So um, I, I'm going to piss a lot of you off for a little bit. I'm sorry. Just, it's just kind of what happens with the crazy song of the week. Uh, now remember we're on radio, so by round of applause, screaming or booing, however you feel to express yourselves. How many of you have heard of a guy named Toby Keith? Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> so now's a bad time to announce he's my special guest. Then. <laughs> yeah, that that wouldn't happen. So he wrote a song called Get Out of My Car. And I thought, uh, like your friend wouldn't give you gas money? What, <laughs> what does this mean? And just a few lines into the song, it hit me and I thought, oh no, don't go there, Toby. Don't, don't do this, Toby. And this was sent to me by a fourth listener. I'm sorry, I don't remember if it was one of you guys or not. No. I, I don't know. Uh, I know you probably are all about some country music, though. Big time country music fan. I'm also lying, so. You, that's a great t-shirt. You should totally. So I'm just going to go ahead and start the song for you. Uh, and don't worry. Up next, we have Greta Christina, so it's worth sitting through this. Here is Toby Keith. Get out of my car. Now, now, now hold on. I have to preface this with saying that um, Nico here reminded me of the very first one we ever did. It was... It was uh, uh, The Little Girl the by little, John Michael Montgomery. Yeah, The Little Girl, in which this, this, there was this horrible portrayal of non-believers and how everyone was... If you're a non-believer, you're, you're constantly on drugs, abusing children, doing horrible things, and the only way to save this child was to take her out of the home and give her to a Christian family, and then suddenly everything was fine. 
Uh, it's a disgusting, disgusting song, and it, it pissed a lot of people off. So the next one I did, I did was funny, and then the segment just took off. And that's kind of why this segment is important, because even as a non-believer, before I really got into this, I mean, five, six years ago, if my daughter was in the car, I felt like it was safe to put country music on if I wanted to have music playing, because I didn't want, you know, something on a hip-hop station or something in a heavy metal song. And then I started paying attention to the lyrics of the country song, and I thought, that's like the worst possible message for my daughter. And so I play these songs now to highlight exactly how dangerous these things can be as it makes people think about it. So I know you're excited to get to Toby Keith's song. So here it is. Toby Keith, Get Out of My Car. I like it, man. You drank all my beer. Okay, hold on. Okay. <laughs> Worst way to start off a conversation ever. I don't think that's the right way to do that. But, but it, when I heard this, I thought, uh-oh. He's talking to a woman. I hope he's not going to tell her to get out of his car. That wouldn't work out too well for me. Uh, let's see what he has to say about it. And the whiskey's all gone. I'm sitting here, ready to get it on. I'm still confused. Why does he have beer and whiskey in his car? Did, uh, did he I, don't, I don't think it's in his car yet. Uh, I don't think it's in his car yet. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, did he drink the whiskey? Or well, he said, just said the whiskey's it's all gone. gone. It's gone. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure if she would have drank it, he would have blamed her for it. <laughs> because if I remember fact, He's there you drink all my beer. <laughs> I am from Texas. I can channel that at any moment. I promise you. So at this point in the story, to catch you back up, <laughs> Toby is now ready to get it on. Are we all good? Okay. You got me thinking you won't. You got me thinking you might. At a three o'clock in the morning, and I can't beat around the bush all night. We've already kissed. We've already kissed. We've already danced, we've already danced You're wondering if you ought to put on your shoes Or pull down your pants Come on. <laughs> Did he buy her dinner? I don't know <laughs> how, how often have you had that dilemma? Should I put on my shoes or take off my pants? Which way do I want to go with this? At this point, I started realizing where he's going with this. And I was hoping Greta wasn't here to hear this part. <laughs> I didn't want to do this to Greta. But here he goes. Pull down your pants. What would it hurt? Pull off that shirt. Hey, we've already come this far. Get out of your clothes. I'll get out of my car. What an asshole. <laughs> yeah, that's a... I am so sorry, Greta. It's a, real, it's a real catch. Sorry, Kyle, but... Can you believe... Can you believe this is an actual song? Like, this is something I would have made up to make fun of country music. But you don't have to because they do it for you. I want to I point something out real quick. So, so assuming they're in the position to get it on, as he says, yeah. they got to be somewhere remote. So either he's... He wants to get it on, or he's willing to kick her out of his car in some remote location. It's, it's a long, dirt country. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be some back road right. or something. Yeah. yeah. That, That's cold-blooded. That's cold-blooded. That's cold. It's and her fault for drinking all the beer, though. It's her fault for drinking all the beer. <laughs> <laughs> she was asking for it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Let's see if he decides to retract his statement. Whichever you choose, I'm 
I'm ready to go. At least he's pro-choice. <laughs> you can get out of the car. He's, Toby <laughs> Keith is pro-choice. Have sex with me or get out. You choose. I'm all about your independence. Bodily autonomy. You can have sex or walk your body. I can take it to the house, baby. Oh, I can drive it on home. We can do it right here. I'll do it somewhere else. But make up your mind. Do something quick. Or I'm gonna do it myself. that line I'm sorry <laughs> oh it. it he doesn't need her <laughs> we already kissed we already kissed well if you've already kissed and danced then naturally that's the third step right and we've already danced Saying? Take off that shirt. Hey, we've already come this far. Get out of your clothes. Or get out of my car. Oh, this is that. This is that really talented part of the song where he's run out of things to say. He's got nothing else to add to the conversation at this point. Walk your ass home in the middle of the night. What do you say? It was like 3 o'clock in the morning, right? What was that? Oh, 3.30. Yeah, it's true. It's got to be at least 3.30. That's horrible. I got out of my clothes. I got out of my clothes? She got out of my car. Oh, right. Ah! <laughs> I love his ending. That's a great ending. It is a great ending, but you know, there are people who live by this stuff. And they take this stuff seriously. Thank you guys so much for joining me for this segment. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you up here. Coming up next, Greta Christina will be right here. More Dogma Debate up next. My mum only lied to me about one thing. Um, she, uh, she said there was a God. <laughs> but that's because when you're a working class mum, Jesus is like an unpaid babysitter. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just sort of like, she, she wasn't hoping I'd be a doctor or a lawyer. She hoped I wouldn't be stabbed to death in a barroom fight, you know. So, went to Sunday school from about the age of four till eight. There was just great teachings of Jesus. I loved Jesus. He was my superhero. Um, he really was. And what I loved about Jesus was he was kind. So I was about eight and my brother must have been 19. He came in once and uh, I was doing uh, something from the Bible and I said, what are you doing? I said, oh, join Jesus. And he went, um, who was Jesus? And I said, well, he was, he was the son of God. He went, why do you believe in God? Right? And my mum went, Bob, shut up. And I knew she had something to hide. 
And I knew, I knew from body language. And then I worked it out and I was an atheist in an hour. You're listening to Dogma Debate with David Smalley. Founded in 2006 for the purpose of realizing one man's vision, the Richard Dawkins Foundation works to remove the corrosive influence of religion in education and in the public square, while also working to eliminate the stigma that surrounds atheism, secularism, and non-belief. People should be free to express their non-belief without risking their jobs, businesses, relationships, and community standing. Because continuing to allow attacks on science, climate change, medical advancements, and sex education has real-world consequences for billions of human beings beyond the discomfort of a few. Freedom for scientists, health and climate researchers, and ordinary human beings to work in understanding our universe and subscribing to an evidence-based world without the interference of religion is paramount if we are going to have a healthy future or else succumb to the darkness of ignorance and despair. The Richard Dawkins Foundation is committed to changing our culture, and you can help by joining, donating to, or volunteering for the Richard Dawkins Foundation at richarddawkins.net slash donate or you can sign up for their newsletter at richarddawkins.net slash subscribe. Reason. Science. Progress. The Richard Dawkins Foundation at richarddawkins.net. To keep our three listeners coming back, we must be doing something right. And if you're the fourth listener, we thank you for the support. Be sure to sign up at login.dogmadebate.com and take advantage of your fourth listener status. Welcome back to Dogma Debate. This is... <laughs> I, met, I, met, I met Star before the show, and, and now every time you guys do that, she plugs her ears and screams. <laughs> Woo! So happy. That's awesome. That's, that's liquor. You're allowed to come up here. That's right. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, like I need to introduce them, Greta Christina and Richard Carrier are with me. Now, coming up next, uh, we will be with Pastor Bob Crossland. So that's going to be a very exciting <laughs> aspect of the show. And I think, I think Richard's actually going to join us at some point later after, yeah. after, after I, I butter Bob up. Richard <laughs> is going to come in. <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the real reason. But yeah, I, I, I would like you to join us in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know you have a, a book out that you're back there uh, actually selling. What, what book is it? Talk about it for just a moment. Well, that's On the Historicity of Jesus is the big book that everybody's been waiting for. Uh, and that came out last year, and that's basically the first book to argue that it's probable that Jesus didn't exist, that he was mythically invented later. Uh, and the first one to actually pass peer review at a major academic press. It was published by the University of Sheffield. Wow. Uh, so, so that's kind of a big deal. It's like the first time this has happened. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm marketing that, uh, I'm promoting that, but I have tons of other books as well. And I've I like that. I'm going to start using it, marketing it instead of selling it. It sounds yeah. so much better. Yeah. <laughs> You're so much more classy. You have to be like, books for sale. You're like... I'm marketing that. <laughs> if you choose to hand me money, that's up to you. <laughs> I'm just here marketing it. It's brilliant. No, I love it. That's, that's really good stuff. I know David Fitzgerald and you are mm -hmm. very good friends, and, and he's been on the show a million times, including like two days ago. Yeah, I heard And it. And, um, and <laughs> I, 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 I turn a lot of people on to his book, Nailed, and I know that you, know, you, know, you kind of were, were an inspiration for oh, that his, as well. His so. book, The Mormons, you got to get that. Everybody's got to get that book. It that is, is hilarious. It's even better on audio. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I did the voiceover for it. It was, it, it took me so long to record that book because it was so funny. Yeah. I had to, I kept fumbling over. I'm like, this can't be real. I'm like Googling it. He's lying. They really say that. Yeah. Okay. I had no idea. So it was, it was a, it yeah, was, it's a yeah. very, very well done book. And so thank you for joining us today. And, yeah. and, and Greta, uh, what is your latest thing that you have going on? I know you actually just released another another book. You're very busy. Yeah, with I, books. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a busy I'm a busy person. Yeah, I just came out with a new book called Comforting Thoughts About Death That Have Nothing to Do with God, and it's out right now in ebook and audio book. Um, and um, thank you. 
Uh, and the, the printed, it's not out in print yet. The print edition is coming probably in the fall. So, but ebook and audiobook is out there. Okay, very cool. So that's actually what I want to talk about now um, is, is dealing with those types of things you know, with, with someone like you. I actually, I'm honored to announce, and this is my first time, I think, publicly announcing it on air. I am, as of a few days ago, officially a certified humanist celebrant. And, oh, thank you, thank you. But uh, it, it meant a lot to me to actually gain that. I did some sort of online ordination one time, kind of to be funny, and then people wanted me to start doing their weddings and things, and they started mentioning, hey, would you consider doing a eulogy and things like that, and I thought, uh, I kind of want to know what I'm doing first. Like, I don't want to just take my little certificate and be like, yeah, I can totally do this. I, I, wanna, I wanted to be respectful to the art itself. And, mm -hmm. and so um, I, I did it through the Humanist Society with uh, American Humanist Association. And so I, I think that, and now, I, now I'm like licensed in all 50 states now to actually perform weddings and all sorts of things. And so uh, when something like this comes up, even though I'm not a humanist chaplain or a counselor by any stretch that I'm, I'm a celebrant, you're kind of the person in the room they look to to go, you know, what do we do? And this, these are one of the things, this is one of the areas where uh, I typically just go back to celebrating the life and talking about the positive things and saying we're here for you. But I wanted to get your take on it because I'm brand new to this and there are still some training videos and things that I have to go through with American Humanist Association. And so I, I recommend if you're interested in doing it, do it through American Humanist Association. They have an extensive training facility uh, uh, website really where you go and you watch these videos online and yeah. you get a lot of good background and so what are some of the resources I know you're also connected with grief beyond belief as well right uh, yeah I mean I'm connected with in that I'm a member of it and I'm a close friend and colleague of Rebecca Hensler who's the woman who Rebecca founded Hensler. it uh, yeah. grief beyond belief for people who aren't familiar with it is an online support group for uh, people who are grieving who are non-believers because a lot of grief support is religious based and even if it's not explicitly religion-based, religion just comes up a lot. And, and that can be, at best, unhelpful, and at worst, it can be actually upsetting. Yeah. Um, you know, to be you know, having somebody tell you, oh, I'm sure God has a plan, when you're like, no, I don't think God had a plan. I think my brother is just dead, and I don't want to hear that God had a plan. Um, so you're asking about if you're, whether you're in some sort of official capacity, you know, you're a celebrant or a chaplain or something, or if you're just a, a friend or a family member wanting to console somebody who's grieving, you know, what, what can you say? And, you know, what kind of comfort can, can we offer? And I think that a mistake that we often make is to think that there's a magic bullet, to think that there's some way to, if I could just find the right thing to say, I'll eradicate the grief. And they'll be like, oh, it's okay now that my brother is dead. Um, and that's, that's just not gonna happen. And I think that, um, and it's this, this odd thing where when I talk about secular and humanist uh, views of death and mortality, there's a lot of atheists who actually push back on it and who say it's like, no, there's no way that that can ever be comforting. There's no way that secular views of, of death and mortality can ever be as comforting as religious views. We shouldn't even pretend to try. And I think that where that comes from is a mistaken idea of what it means to offer comfort. You know, comfort doesn't mean eradicating the grief. It just means making it somewhat better, alleviating it to some extent. It can mean giving people a sense of hope, a sense that, okay, right now you feel really horrible, but at some point you have something to come back to. You have a foundation in your life. You're going to be able to... Um, you know, to get on with your life. But paradoxically, saying that is a really bad thing to do. Generally speaking, if it's like if somebody is really grieving, anything that you say that seems dismissive of it, that seems like, well, yeah, you're grieving now, but in a year from now you'll be fine, that can just seem really dismissive. And, you know, I have this book, it's called Comforting Thoughts About Death that have nothing to do with God, and it does have, you know, philosophies and views of death and mortality that can make it, you know, easier to deal with. But if you're just really in that moment, somebody is just grieving really hard, and they're not asking you for philosophies, they're just saying, I'm really grieving hard, there's kind of three things to say. Sort of the three magic things, air quotes magic things, are, I'm really sorry, this really sucks, what can I do to help? Yeah. Um, and you know, try, if you try to like come, if somebody's just really grieving hard and you're trying to like make it better, that can seem trivializing. That can seem like, you, and it can seem like you don't want to deal with their grief, so you're trying to make it disappear. And j really just being with people who are grieving and just by your presence, 
being the life that they're going to return to, that can that that can be hugely consoling. That makes me feel a lot better because I think I accidentally did something very close to that today. Actually, uh, I have a friend online who is going through something like this, and he just found out some really bad news. And he called me and he was talking about it, and I that's what I said. I said, you know, you have a whole um, community of people out here that love you, that love your family, that are here for you. And um, if there's anything at all we can do, let me know. And uh, we went into some details about how we can help. We can talk about it on the show. We can, if there is a financial issue, we could do a fundraiser. If there is, uh, if there is some sort of issue with um, an organization that we may be connected with, we can connect you with that organization and perhaps make something else happen. We're here to help to ease as much of the pain as we possibly can, mm -hmm. but don't ever think you're alone in this. And it, he, he was very emotional about that, and he just said, that makes me feel so much better, thank you. And I was kind of shocked that it did actually make him feel better. I thought I was looking for that magic thing to make it all go away, and I realized at that moment I had nothing to make it all go away, so I just said what was on my mind, and it sounds like it was pretty close, so I, yeah. Feel, yeah. I feel good about yeah. that. I would definitely see that, because it's, like, it's this sort of paradox where if you're trying to make it magically go away, that can make people feel like you're pushing them away. And what people really need when they're grieving oh, yeah. is to still feel that there's a connection. Um, and so if you're just with them and just expressing your compassion and your sympathy um, and offering help, uh, that makes them feel like you're really there. And something you said actually that, that, that makes a difference, this is something again that Rebecca Hensler at Grief Beyond Belief has talked about, is if you're offering help, it's a really good idea to offer something specific. Because sometimes when you say, what can I do to help? If somebody's really deeply grieving, sometimes they don't, they don't know how to answer that question. You know, and, and sort of the burden of trying to think of, okay, my life is falling apart here. What, you know, I don't know how you can help me. But if you say something specific, whether it's like, you know, what can I do to help? Uh, I can help clean up your house. I can babysit your kids. Uh, I can, if there's a financial issue, I can help do some fundraising. Um, you know, these are the, you know, I can bring you food. You know, here, here are the things that I can do to help. That can make it seem less, it, it doesn't put the burden on them to figure out what, what they need. Because if somebody's really grieving, hard sometimes they can't answer that yeah I know and there was yeah. a there was a woman who gave a presentation in Chicago and her name escapes me right now but she was uh, one of the victims of a, I think a tornado in Oklahoma well it's probably oh, Rebecca, Rebecca Vitzman. Vitzman yeah I think I think it was <laughs> is she the, I don't She's know, the I'm actually I'm an atheist woman I yeah. don't. I, I don't remember. I, 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 I remember. I remember that. I remember yeah. that. But that, I don't know I if that was her, her who gave the talk. I, I don't oh. remember. But I, I know that she was. She could have been. I'm really bad with that. <laughs> was that her? <laughs> yes, Brandy. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes, that was her. Okay. So yeah. 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 there we go. Yeah. Uh, so she was when she was talking about it. She was saying people were being so sweet and saying, "Well, you've lost everything. You obviously need to replace things. Here are some gift cards." And they were giving her gift cards, and she she was amazed at that. I don't have time to shop. I have to put my life back together. I don't have time to go spend hours. I appreciate it. I love this. Imagine if you could volunteer to go shopping for that person with a list of items. Little things like that, like you said, being very specific. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of times people just, just, don't, just don't think about those types of things. Yeah, no, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. And also listening to what people say, because I could see somebody else saying, I don't want you to shop for me because I want to pick up my own stuff. You, sure. you buy my microwave oven, you're going to get the wrong kind. Yeah. You know, it's, um, and so <laughs> offering things but listening to what the person says they need, mm -hmm. uh, that, that can make a real difference. Because people do have different needs and they can change at different times. You know, there's times if I'm grieving, there's times when what I want is to like sit on your sofa and cry for three hours. And there's times where what I want is for you to take me out to a movie so I don't have to think about it. Um, and and that's that's true for, that's different for different people and it's different for peop the same people at different times yeah you know, so, so really it's listening not, is, helps a lot yeah and it's not always just like a death it's not always something like that any tragic event someone in their family is sick struggling with something some major life changing event something along those lines now Richard I know this isn't your like specialty it's not no. what you do but have you had situations like this come up to where someone looks to you for advice and you you're kind of finding yourself going, I can give you a really good book to read. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I, I mean, frankly, in this conversation, I represent the typical idiot who has no idea what to do. Um, I'm going to save a clip of you saying that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm cop. gonna play it at it's the totally fair. worst times ever. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, I I've been in this situation where I like I like really I feel really bad for because it's usually someone else who's grieving for someone, um, someone who I really care about. And, and I don't know how to help them or what to do and how to respond. And in fact, I mean, even just the things that you've just said just now is really informative and helpful. And then I've read like your book as well. And I, I found that a really good contribution. And I'm so glad that grief beyond belief as a thing exists now. Um, so, uh, so all, all of that I think is, is important for people like me so that when we get in a situation like that, we can go somewhere and say, well, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know how, to, sure. to comfort my friend, I don't know uh, what to do. And and it's, for me, it's always I've always focused my attention and skill and, and knowledge on coping with my own mortality. It's it's very difficult to deal with someone else dealing with a loss of someone because that that's a completely different problem than facing your own mortality. And and even in terms of like religion and so forth, that, sure. that those are two unrelated issues. Is the idea like, well, where do all my loved ones go, versus where do I go? Um, and, and I don't know how to, one of the, that half of that equation I have no skill with. And I don't know. I was actually going to ask you about that, Greta. Mm -hmm. it, it, have you had any pushback or any question about this? Like, what about my own mortality? What about, I'm an atheist, I've accepted it, these are all the things, I can argue with believers all day, but I am terrified of death now because I don't have an afterlife. Do you address that at all? I do, actually. Oh, yeah. It's one of the things I talk mm -hmm. about in the book yeah. is, because I think that grief for other people who have died and fear about your own mortality and anxiety about your own mortality, they're not the same issue, but they're very closely related. They're very much flip sides of the coin. And, you know, it's just sort of coping with the, the finality of death. is It can be very hard to get your mind around and very upsetting to get your mind around. And I think one of the things that makes other people's grief difficult to deal with or even your own grief about somebody you love dying is that one of the things that happens is that it reminds you of your own mortality. And so, yes, I do. it is something that I talk about uh, in, in the book is not just how do you deal with grief for other people who have died, but how do you cope with the fact that we are all eventually going to die and that that death really is going to be final. Well, you're just full of good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you came here to see a party. We're talking yeah, about death, yeah, baby. That's all. We're all going <laughs> to die. But, the, but this is actually It's super important. That, it's very it, important. It is really important. And it's actually, I mean, of course it's a you know, painful and difficult issue. Yeah. And yet, one thing I've discovered is once people start talking about it, they really want to talk about it. It can be really, really difficult to get a conversation about death going. It's like, I'm a public speaker. I have a list of topics that I'm willing to talk on, and people hardly ever invite me to talk about death. <laughs> um, but I wonder they, why that right, would be. I wonder why. But when they do... But it's so important. It's I mean, so it's important. Something. When they yeah. do, people really welcome the conversation. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I think is really important for non-believers to remember is we tend to concede that ground. We tend to say, well, of course, religious ways of dealing with death and grief and mortality, of course, course those would be better. The only thing about them that sucks is that they are not true. Um, <laughs> and, and the thing is that I actually think that that's a profound source of comfort for me, knowing that my secular ways of coping with grief and mortality are based in reality and knowing that I'm not lying to myself. That's a huge source of comfort. And when I was a, uh, did have supernatural beliefs, it, and that I used to console myself in the face of grief and mortality, there was always this sort of uneasiness. There was always this sense in the back of my mind that I don't really have any good reason to think this, and I'm really just kind of making this up as I go along based on what I want to be true. Mm -hmm. And that's not very comforting. That's very unsettling. And I think that we need to, to own that and to, to understand that you know, no, there's no secular humanist philosophy of death that's going to eradicate grief or fear of mortality, but there's no religious view. I mean, it's like religious people, you go to a religious funeral and they're crying too, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't mean they're hypocrites, it means they're human. You know, so it, it's not like religion does a whole lot better at dealing yeah. with this. Even their, I mean, frankly, it's, it, it's only the fact that it stops them thinking that it helps because otherwise if you really think through their so-called solutions to the problem, they're kind of shitty, and so if you, if you think about it, um, I mean, just I mean, no the most offense, basic, <laughs> no. <laughs> the most basic idea. If you're dealing with uh, hell belief, for example, that that you might go to heaven and eternally have to know that someone you loved is in hell for all eternity. I mean, that yeah. that would be hell for well, you. Well, my like, mom, how would you? My uh, mom fixed that. She told. I asked her about that. I said, "How can you possibly <laughs> be eternally happy in heaven?" knowing that I was in hell, and she said, God will make me forget about you. <laughs> but that's horrible. I'm serious. That's so horrible. 
I mean, I know. I've heard that. I've that's heard that. There's like, there's like serious theologians. That's a philosophical problem called the magic pill. Yeah. If you just Google the magic pill, yeah. it's yeah. Okay. been dealt with in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating point. Yeah. I was just like, oh, that's nice of him. So you yeah, could, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but normally, Thanks, Mom. normally the magic pill is used in like how you could be evil if you could forget about the fact that you've done all these evil things using a magic uh. pill. But if, if so, if God can just make you forget stuff, then God can make you do any horrible thing mm -hmm. conceivable. That should not be comforting. That should not be comforting. <laughs> no, it well, shouldn't. You're right. <laughs> You're I mean, right. <laughs> suppose I, I would think God, that's that terrifying. what makes us the the best part of us is that we love people. The best part of us is that we love our family, that we love our friends. And so, what are you <laughs> saying that when you go to heaven, that gets taken away? Right. You know, yeah, that's yeah. that's horrible. It's yeah. like it makes you not be you. It's yeah, like if no, if, you right know, on. Yeah. And so, therefore, it's not really me up there in heaven because mm -hmm. the me who is me is the person who loves the people in my life and cares whether they're oh, being tortured. Please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. On. That is beautiful. Yeah. That is beautiful. One thing, one thing that I've often said is I think that my secularism really sort of ignited in me, um, I guess, realizing an importance of life. I, I think once I realized this wasn't a practice run and that this was, this was my only shot, it got real. Yes. And I'm like, okay, every single person I interact with now, this matters. Because when I'm gone, this may be the only interaction they have of me, the only memory that could possibly live on. I may live on after I die in the memories of all of you. What experience did you have of me? In the 40 seconds we interacted, how did I treat you? How did we interact? And so I started, I started thinking, you know, I, I got so much work to do. I've got... I've got, I've got to get on the ball. I've got to, get, I've got to change the world. Uh, three, even if it's three listeners at a time, I've got to make a difference. I've got to do this. I've got to, I've got to organize the garage. I don't want my son to have to deal with that crap. Like, I, I started feeling like life was super, super important. Yeah. And, and so in my book I wrote, um, you won't have the chance to make a difference after life, so be someone's guardian angel now. And this concept of humanism really came full circle to hit home. Like, this is really for me what's so much more important. If I go back to my days of belief and I think about only God can judge me being in heaven later, looking down on people, getting wings, flying around, I don't even know where I would go, but assuming I was flapping somewhere, <laughs> I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking that's the real life. This sort of seemed like, like kindergarten. Like it didn't really matter if you didn't color it correctly. Nobody's gonna care. Mm -hmm. You know, and so mm. now it, it just seems very, very important. Yeah. And I, I've, had, yeah. I've had theists then tell me, yeah, but none of this matters if you don't believe in eternity. And I'm like, oh, it absolutely matters. And to me, it's even more important. Yeah, no, spot on. And I think in general, this gets back to that, that problem that I have with the divide between dealing with your own mortality and dealing with, with the death of other people that you love. Because, uh, I mean, just to give you an example, my, my grandfather, when people were saying, you need to get your will together, and he says, oh, I don't care what you do with my stuff. I won't even be around then. I won't care. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, so it was much more it's much easier to deal with your own mortality once you kind of accept the reality <laughs> like fight over it just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cage fight or well, something we, I don't we, care we were such a nice family no one would have fought yeah, over it so cool. I think he knew that we would we would be able to sort it out but uh uh, but that was that was the thing is it was easier to deal with his own mortality because it's his, it's his own and when you're dead you're not even gonna be around to like worry about what what has happened but when you when you lose someone you love like you you know you're going to be alive for maybe another 20 40 years and you'll never get like they're gone and you'll never get to be with them again that's a much seems to me a much more difficult thing to deal with um and and so it, it's a different problem i think and and that's the problem that i don't have enough knowledge to, to conquer yet. And so I, I'm glad that there are people trying to answer that question and, and work on it. You know, it. Uh, I, I know we give you know, re Republicans a lot of crap, especially on this show, but uh, Chris Christie was in an interview with someone and he talked about his mother dying. And I just assumed he was going to go right to Jesus and God and all these other things because he left her bedside to go do something, and I don't forget what it was, something about a campaign, I don't remember, but he left to go do something and then she died while he was gone. But he was pretty sure she was going to die while he was gone. Mm -hmm. And he said in the interview, I, just, I knew he was going to go straight to religion, but what he said was, um, she knew I had stuff to do. She knew I was working. She knew that a lot of people depended on me. And he said, she grabbed my hand after hours of us talking, and she just said to me, there's nothing left unsaid between us. Go. Go do your job. Go live your life. And I, I teared up. I thought, that is such a beautiful secular way to think about it. 
There's nothing left unsaid between us. It doesn't matter if you're standing right here or you're four feet away or if you're 4,000 miles away. When I'm gone, we're just as good as we are right now. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thought. And I think I want to carry that with me and make sure that there's nothing left unsaid between any of us, which is why I always tell you exactly what's on my mind. (laughs) I don't want you to ever be wondering. To me, it's 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 an obligation to be genuine. Yeah, it's a way to live, right, a way to live your life, the way to have your friendships and and loves and so on. Yeah, I I very much agree with that. And it's true, and that kind of connects with what you were saying before about it, you know, as unpleasant as death is to think about it and mortality is to think about it, it really does focus your life. You know, it's like, you know, I don't have time. You know, and I, one of the things I say in the book is I would love to think that I'm the kind of person who would spend immortality doing wonderful things and I spend a (laughs) century reading all the great literature and then another century like you know building a wonderful foundation for the homeless and so on I know myself I would spend eternity sitting around on the sofa watching TV um, and eating chocolate chips because I've got time I can do all that (laughs) stuff later Um, I'll save the world later I can do that later because I have all the time in the world knowing that we're mortal and that's true both about our own life and about the life of the people we love knowing that it's limited really does act to make us make it matter yeah it does so give us the title of the book again it's called Comforting Thoughts About Death That Have Nothing to Do with God. It's right now in ebook and audiobook, mm-hmm. and print is coming later. And one yeah. more time, the title of your book, Richard. On the Historicity of Jesus. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Greta Christina, Richard Carrier. Thank you so much, Greta. This was awesome. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Coming up next, Pastor Bob Crossland will be right here for your enjoyment. <laughs> and I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot. More Dogma Debate up next.